because he won the first interview. Okay. So after he comes and settles down, he stops. Okay, uh, so let's start. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Professor Karen Daniel's talk. Before I introduce her, uh, I should welcome the students, the very enthusiastic students who've joined us today from Jain University. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, you can ask questions. Are you okay with being interrupted? Yes, so please interrupt her. Please ask questions. Okay, then we know that, you know, colloquia are supposed to be at a level that, you know, people without training in this particular area can understand. So if you have any questions, please shoot. And uh, so let me then introduce Karen. So uh, Professor Daniels is a distinguished professor of physics at the North Carolina State University. Uh, she works on a range of very diverse and very interesting soft ma matter problems, including granular flow, fracturing, elast elastocapillarity, soft earth geophysics. I'm sure I'm missing many things. <laughs> yeah, and of course, liquid metal flow, which you tell us about today. So Karen is a, a, a fellow of the American Physical Society, the AAAS. She's also part of this, um, of an initiative at the NCSU on uh, developing diverse departments. Something like, like that. Yeah. Something like that, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so today she'll tell us about fingers, froze, fractals, and flows in liquid metal flow. All right, thank you so much. Um, I had the opportunity to come over here at the beginning of my stay. Um, so I'm here on a Fulbright Fellowship um, for four months, and there was a wonderful conference the first, very first week I was in town, um, and so we decided I should come back um, and visit when it was calmer and got to see wonderful labs this morning. And I'm really happy that I decided to talk about this today based on many of the things I saw um, in labs here. OK, so yes. There's a whole talk, but if you interrupt me with interesting questions, I'll answer your questions instead of finishing the talk, <laughs> right? So if, if something I say isn't clear, just raise your hand. We'll talk about it, and then we'll continue. Um, so this work, of course, is not my own work. It's the work of many people. Um, and what I particularly like about this project is that many of the things that I'm working on here, um, I actually I have trouble understanding because they involve electrochemistry. Um, <laughs> and I'm no electrochemist. Um, and so in order for us to sort of build up an understanding of this problem, I'm working with people from physics, from chemical engineering, and from applied math. And even the chemical engineers are very diverse in what they know how to do. Um, and so we are just beginning to put all the puzzle pieces together and understand how the parts connect. Um, and so you'll be seeing contributions from all of these people um, in the course of the talk. And the picture that's up here is a teaser. Um, and we will get to that picture um, as we go on. Okay, but that is a liquid metal. Who here has played with mercury? You're not allowed to, of course. No. Right. <laughs> right, so the, the camera can't see who raised their hand. Um, so, I mean, mercury, you've, if you haven't played with it, you've seen the little skittering droplets, and they're beautiful and shiny. Um, and that's what this project is about. Um, but egain, which is eutectic gallium indium, has a key benefit um, over mercury and that it's not toxic. You're allowed to play with it, <laughs> okay? Um, and so what we have here is a little bit of egain that's been dropped on a slide. Um, and it is a room temperature liquid metal, okay? And that's because it's a mixture of gallium and indium. Gallium is nearly, you, gallium will melt in your hand, but won't melt at room temperature. Um, and so it has a couple interesting features. It's a metal which means the, the bonds are very strong. It has a very high surface tension. So water has a high surface tension. We think of it as having a high surface tension. This is 10 times larger than water, essentially. Okay. Um, but its viscosity is only twice that of water. Okay. It's much denser than water. Okay. Um, and what you're going to see when I play this again um, is that this is a droplet that's been spread out on the slide with a Q-tip, and it's formed an oxide on the surface. 
okay? And that oxide means that it's got a solid crust, okay? And then the person holding the Q-tip is gonna put some hydrochloric acid on it that's gonna dissolve the oxide and it'll go back to looking like a mercury droplet again. So let me play that again. So this has an oxide on its surface um, that's like a crust and dissolving the oxide, now we get that nice spherical ball like mercury, okay? So this is cool. This is not even the coolest thing I'm gonna show you, okay? But by just what I've just shown you, you have a metal that's completely flexible and which you can have a crust to help hold it in place. And so engineers are really excited to use this to do all sorts of device building, okay? So for the last 20 years, there's a ton of papers out there with people building um, antennas. You can make an antenna inside of a flexible polymer. Now you have a stretchable antenna. It's tunable. Um, you can use this liquid metal to make pumps and valves, things like that. And because it conducts electricity and is also a liquid, right, you, get, you can sort of combine mechanical and electric properties in, in the same system. Um, people are embedding P, um, the liquid metal in, again, flexible polymers and making little robots that can walk by electrical activation. Um, they've made grippers, they've made sensors, they've made oscillators. The engineers are building all sorts of stuff out of this, okay? And it's benefited mostly from it being liquid, but also because this oxide, if you were to cut one of these things, the crust will seal it off and the liquid metal won't leak out, right? And so it's really promising for a lot of sort of soft robotics, soft sensor, human interface types of things, also because it's non-toxic, okay? So I'm not, I'm not an engineer. I'm not gonna build any of these devices. I look at this and I'm like, there's some really interesting fluid dynamics going on there, right? And I'd like to understand that because it's almost as fun as playing with mercury and I'm allowed to do it, okay? So when you're, not, when you're in air, this crust can allow you to stabilize all sorts of structures. So unlike squeezing you know, water droplets out of a syringe, right, this has this oxide skin, right, and so you can actually get structures to stay where you put them. Okay? And so this makes it possible to sort of build all sorts of interesting things. Um, I'm not gonna play this whole movie, right, but suffice it to say this is cool because of the oxide scum on the surface. Okay? And in fact, that's something that appears all over lots and lots of systems, right? So a fluid that has a scum on its surface. I mean, we've all seen it in our tea, right? And if you're boiling milk and you get the scum on the surface, right? This is a, a common thing, right? Fluids that have a slightly solid layer at the surface. Um, last week, I went to this cafe in Bangalore, and what you could, the, the liquid nitrogen is not the point of the, <laughs> but what's inside those cups is a, a little um, liquid, tasty treat that's encapsulated by a solid membrane so you can just pop the little liquid ball into your mouth and eat it, right? So cooks want to play with these sorts of things, right? And if you go down to our, our cells, um, these, are, these aren't actual cells, these are artificial, but we all know that our cells have bilayers, right, that are supporting a sack of very important liquid um, inside of them, right? So at many length scales, right, understanding liquids that have a little crusty bit on the surface is really a common, common thing, okay? Um, and so from a, you know, the biophysics, you know, is a, what, you know, what allows our cells to work is some of the same things that are letting, what, letting those droplets take their shape as well, okay? So it's a really common geometry and not one that's been studied from a fundamental fluid dynamics perspective. And I think this is a system that allows for a lot of sort of basic science studies um, because it's an easily controllable system. Okay, so this is, the, this is the slide that got me interested in this project. Okay, so my colleague Michael Dickey, who's in chemical engineering, um, showed me uh, this uh, pictures on the left and this movie on the right, and I'm gonna walk you through them. Okay, so at the top, you can see a nice spherical droplet of this egain being ejected from a syringe, okay? And on the right, you can see it's super shiny. You can even see the camera inside the, pit, inside the shiny bit if you look carefully, okay? And this is not being done in air. This is being done inside sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide can uh, dissolve that oxide, okay? So this is a system where you are basically just looking at that shiny ball of, of liquid metal, okay? And it, so this does not have a scum on the outside, okay? However, if you apply a volt of electricity, very small amount, okay, across it, this is a metal and it will oxidize, <laughs> right? Metals oxidize when you expose them to a voltage, okay? So it gets an oxide on its surface, okay? And you can see in the second row that now that droplet has collapsed somewhat under gravity because its surface tension 
is not as high. And we'll talk about why that's the case. But you know, surface tension wants to minimize the surface, so it's nice and spherical. And it's a high surface tension. You lower the surface tension a little bit, you get a little flatter droplet. You apply another half a volt, and this thing has totally pancaked. <laughs> okay? That's the side view. If you look at the top view, it has not pancaked, it has made a flower. Okay? So this is a material that I told you had 10 times the surface tension of water, and we've gotten it to go flat and make a flowery, complicated shape. And it's shiny and pretty. And I was like, hi, can I join your project? <laughs> I want to be your graduate student. <laughs> right? And Michael says, OK, how about we just work with you and you, you not be my graduate student? Right? So Colin is his graduate student at the time. Okay? And I'm going to play the movie now so you can see a movie of how that uh, forms. Okay? So again, this is in sodium hydroxide in an electrolyte. You can use any electrolyte. Okay, you apply a little bit of a voltage, and this droplet goes unstable. Okay? And at the top view, we're not injecting fluid. This is just the same droplet spreading under gravity as its surface tension gets lower and lower and lower. And it makes these you know, fingery blobby things. Okay? So I was like, I'm signing on. I want to join. Okay, and so, When you lower the surface tension, uh, how low can it go? How low can it go? We will like, get there. Like fluid membranes have yes. near zero. Exactly. We will get there. We will get there. Okay. So at this point, we're like, we know it's dropping low. We don't have a measurement of it at this stage yet. Yeah. So uh, can you sort of like how the NMH, uh, like how actually the NMH aqueous uh, solution is used here? Okay. So the NMH is doing two things. One, um, it can conduct electricity, so we can actually apply a voltage. That's good. And the second is, it's actually a solvent for the oxide. And so when the oxide's being made, it's both being made at the interface and it's being uh, okay. dissolved. No, so but where are. is NMH here? Every, the whole bath. It's, oh. all, it's, all, it's a whole bath. Oh, it's, a it's just living in NMH sodium too. hydroxide. Okay. And we could use hydrochloric acid. We could use any salt we want. Sodium hydroxide is nice and safe <laughs> um, and good for physicists to use. Right? I don't need a fume hood. It has a lot, number of advantages. We can control the molarity if we want to. You know, my, my chemical knowledge is enough to control molarity. Right? Um, so it's, a, it's just a convenience. It's a convenient electrolyte. Okay. Here, uh, uh, the here is minus one yeah, so, the so this is relative to something called the open circuit potential. So these are, in, these are relative voltages to a point that doesn't matter for this graph. <laughs> for this, for, I'll, I will get to a better definition of it as we go. Yeah. Um, but the various figures that different people have made are using a different convention of zero, depending on who made them. OK, so surface tensions. If you're not familiar with surface tension, we're going to go on a little excursion for that. So, oh, yeah. Only pancaking. But why fingering? We'll come to that, too. Okay. Yeah, we will come to why is it fingering. OK. But first, we need to make sure we have a good enough understanding of surface tension. Okay. So if you bring your clothes to the dry cleaners, right, they're going to use an organic solvent of some sort, right, or you clean with alcohol. And the reason is those have really low surface tension. They can get into the crevices of your clothes, and they can clean them. Okay. Water does not have a very low surface tension. Okay. So if you're going to use water to clean, you always add a surfactant, because right, that gets the surface tension low enough that you can actually collect your dirt. Okay. So if we take water, has a surface tension of 70 millinewtons per meter, and you add surfactant, you drop the surface tension in half. Okay, that's about as low as you can go. Okay, so good surfactants will drop it about in half. All right, we're going to use, okay, I'll have to restart Zoom when I use it for something. Okay, um, I'll just close this for now. Okay, um, okay. metals have a bit much higher surface tension than water, okay? And so the question is, what is this surfactant that's doing such a good job of pancaking it? Okay, so that's one question we're going to want to address. How is this happening? Okay. Um, and in fact, this is, you shouldn't take this as literally the correct oxide. It's one of the, one of the oxides it might be making. Okay. But if you make an oxide, you have the metal, and you've got an OH group on the other end. And the metal is metalphilic, and the OH group is hydrophilic. Right? And so the oxide is going to orient, so the metal is on the metal side and the OH is on the water side. And if you know a little bit about lipids right, and, and the formation of you know, lipid you know, bilayers in our cell, one of the things that you know, 
we learn in our basic biology classes is that lipids have a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end, and this is why they make nice membranes, right? Okay, and soap molecules also have this property, a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. So in this case, we have a metalphilic and a hydrophilic end. And so whatever oxide we're making, it's gonna arrange on the interface much like a surfactant molecule does, and therefore it's acting like a surfactant, okay? So if you um, measure the surface tension of one of these droplets, you know, by measuring the contact um, angle, right? So traditional methods of measuring um, contact angles to get surface tension, okay? And you apply a voltage, um, and again, don't worry about what the, what the unit, what this is referenced to here, just that we are changing the voltage, right? And this is actually increasing the voltage, um, going from more negative to more positive, okay? At first, the surface tension goes up, and then it just plummets, right? And at this point, we can't measure surface tensions anymore because the droplet has pancaked too far, right? And we, don't, we can't get a good measurement, okay? Um, and actually, this is an earlier paper before I joined the project, okay? But it looked like it was going zero because it was just spreading out. Okay, so we need a way to get a better measurement, okay? Um, all right, in case people don't know where surface tension comes from, I'm gonna do a physics explanation of it that's at the molecular scale because we're gonna need some of this information later on, okay? So if you're at the surface of a fluid, you are missing some of your neighbors, right? You don't have the neighbors above you, okay? And if each of the, the bonds in your liquid are some, you know, potential of this sort that's pretty typical for a liquid, right? Every one of those bonds contributes a minus amount, but the ones in the bulk have more neighbors, so they are more negative, right? This guy is short some neighbors, so it's less negative, so, it is the, so the surface is the less preferred state compared to the bulk, okay? And this is quite a general argument, okay? And so what surface tension is, is the energy per unit area of surface that that is costing you, right? That, that you are missing, you're that far above the lowest you know, energy state, the preferred state. So I actually like to think of surface tension as an energy per unit area, right, rather than as a tension, which is a force per line. Those have the same units, but for me, this makes more sense, right? That there's an energetic cost to generating interface, okay? Um, okay, so the... See kilojoules per meter squared. You're squared, exactly. Right. And that turns out the same yeah. units as newtons per meter. Right, right. But I think that as, for me as a physicist, the energetic cost to make interface is easier for me to understand. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So what does a surfactant do? Okay, a surfactant stands for surface active agent. And if you stick a surfactant on the surface, and I've drawn these as like little lipids with two tails, because that's the, the picture we know from our biology classes, right? then you've given those molecules at the surface some extra neighbors. Now, they're not as nice as the neighbors they want, but they're at least neighbors, right? And so this actually reduces that gap, right? So now these guys are in less of an energy deficit than they were compared to the bulk now that they have a few neighbors, okay? And so this now costs less energy per unit area to make this interface, okay, which means it's a lower surface tension, okay? So when you add a contaminant at the surface, that tends to lower the surface tension, okay? Questions about that? Okay. And this is quite a general argument. You know, this is, the, I, made, I made this look like lipids, okay, but this would be true if those were oxide molecules and this were, above it was an electrolyte and below it was a liquid metal, okay? All right, so how low can the surface tension go? All right, so this is some work by Michael Dickey's student, Min Young Song, um, who graduated a couple years ago, and the experiment she did was to take a glass capillary and just use a syringe pump to drive fluid stream, squirt liquid out. So you have a liquid stream falling, okay? And it eventually hits the bottom <laughs> of the container. This is all in sodium hydroxide. Um, and all of the experiments are gonna be hooked up. And so this is an electrochemical setup. You actually use three electrodes. Because there's electrochemistry happening, in order to hold a constant voltage, you need both a working electrode right, a reference, a counter electrode. So this is what you usually think of as having a plus and minus voltage. Okay, but you need what users call the potentiostat that can monitor with reference to a reference electrode, okay, where there's a known electrochemical uh, state so that you can maintain a constant voltage because there's an electrochemical reaction going on that's making extra voltage, okay. So everything's being done here with three electrodes, okay, 
And what you can see is um, that's a very nice liquid stream. Would you agree? Right? It's very smooth, right? So this is, you know, normally streams you know, start to develop instabilities, right? Okay, this one has not, okay? You can also see that when it hits the, uh, the base, right, some of them roll off and lose electrical contact. So the metal itself is running all the way up through here to here. So the metal is an electrical contact that's in the stream, but once it rolls off, right, it goes off to the side, it loses electrical contact, the oxide dissolves, and it goes back to being a nice sphere. Okay? But this stream is telling us that the surface tension is quite low. So you want to estimate how low, can it, how low did it really go. Okay? And to do that, we're going to use the Rayleigh plateau instability. And so one of the benefits of working with fluids is that there's a, you know, centuries of flu good classic fluid dynamics instabilities where the instabilities are well known and characterized and we can just compare to them, right? I yeah. Just had a quick question. So what was the substrate in that? Uh, uh, that was just plexiglass or glass. I forget if it's plexiglass or glass at the bottom. Okay, so hydrophilic. It, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And there's almost certainly a fluid layer underneath the, the okay. yeah. But we haven't actually characterized that interface terribly well. We will have to worry about that down the road, but okay. So this is the Rayleigh plateau instability. If you've got a stream falling, there's two curvatures, right? There's the curvature around the stream, and there's the curvature if the stream gets wavy, right? Okay, and so the circles, right, are going to have, and you can calculate the Laplace pressure, right, for a curved interface, and there's two different, inter there's two different curvatures, right? And there's an instability that occurs that when the stream curvature dominates over the wave curvature, right, eventually the stream's gonna break up into droplets, okay? And if that's not happening, that's probably because you have zero surface tension, and so this effect doesn't matter, okay? And so there's a, what you can do is track how far down a stream you can go before you develop instability, and that's a measure of what the surface tension is, okay? So it's using a known fluid instability to estimate the surface tension. So Minya built a basically uh, half meter long tube, and, th and you can probably just see the very thin thread going all the way down. And this thread makes it all the way to the bottom of 64 centimeters without developing a Rayleigh plateau instability. Okay, and so if we plug that in to the time to go unstable, you know, we estimate this is probably it's probably higher than this because there's probably some other effects. Okay, but 10 to the minus, it, it is an unmeasurably low surface tension. We cannot get a good estimate of how close to zero it is. Okay, it seems to be very, very close to zero. Okay, and we don't have it, we didn't have a tube longer than 64 centimeters, so we didn't, we couldn't, you know, go this further. Okay, so this is an argument for it being a very, very low surface tension. And yeah, so the, so the fluid stream is falling that whole time going down. It does, yeah, and so we actually use part of, we can actually do, there's imperfections on the surface and we've done some tracking of those, so we, there's, some, there's some more details to this that I'm not telling you about, yeah. But yeah, you do need to check that the velocity is, and it actually, if there is some surface layer, that layer may not be moving at the same speed as the fluid in the center, and so this is only an estimate. Yeah, this is only an estimate. Okay, so recently, oh, these aren't playing, that's super sad. Um, why are you not playing? I might start up the other document to get these to play. Um, so there's another instability that's known. Um, I'll switch to running in this. Um, oops. Uh, sorry. I should have checked all the movies before I used the PowerPoint. Um, There's some really great movies in here. So another instability is if you have a falling, you've probably done this with honey, right? If you have a falling stream of honey, you can look at the coiling radius, okay? And that's something that um, is quite well known. Uh, again, another classic fluid instability, um, okay? And so here is, so these are slowed down to one-fifth speed so that you can actually see some of the dynamics. So this is uh, postdoc Carmen Lee who's working in my lab right now. Um, and she, we're dropping the, the height from the, from the top of the, the syringe to this pile that you're seeing is 10 centimeters. So these have already been falling quite a ways when they get here. Um, the coiling diameter for reference is about uh, two millimeters, okay? So you're not seeing the whole stream, okay? And you can measure that coiling radius, okay? 
Um, so at the left, we're applying a fairly low, she's actually doing constant current here instead of constant voltage. So there's more of the oxide being formed on the right. So every time you form an oxide molecule, that's a current. That's a piece of current coming through. So you can actually count the electrons coming through as current, and that's how many oxide molecules you've made. So she's making more oxide on the right, and she's making less oxide on the left. So the left is the one where we see the nice clean stream. Doesn't have a really tip plateau instability. Is anybody disturbed by the movie on the right? <laughs> what, what's going wrong? <laughs> Well, how would you describe what it's doing? As coiling or as cracking, right? It's like spaghetti breaking, right? So we have gone into a regime. There's also some fumes, yes. <laughs> That's a good sign something's gone wrong. <laughs> yes, um, so in fact, the, you know, the, oxide, um, the oxide is actually an opaque oxide, and so when it gets broken off, and we think that's just the oxide being you know, sent off, like, a, like it's like a puff of smoke, right? But that's, this is like doing something, and I would call a thing on the right, that is not a fluid behavior. Fluids do not crack like spaghetti, <laughs> right? So this means that we're building up a solid crust there, okay? So we can take it from a point where it has a very small amount of oxide, it's still largely behaving like a fluid, there's, there's oxide on the surface, right? but it's still largely behaving like a fluid. If we push it too far, it's not. And this is a theme we're going to come back to a couple times. Yeah? So I have a curiosity question. Love those. Curiosity questions. So when the fluid is falling uh, in, in this film, so the thing is that it's, it, there's a nice streamline. Uh, let's take the one on the left. Let's look at one on the left. <laughs> right. Uh, there's a nice streamline, and then about, um, uh, sort of one-fifth the height of the column, mm -hmm. okay, the, it deviates from the, uh, from, from the straight line. Yeah, because it's kind of doing this coiling behavior. Yeah, the question is why does this happen? Because, I mean, it's almost anticipating mm -hmm. where the bottom is. Yep. So is there a kind of a shock which travels? Yeah, and actually you see this in regular fluids too. If you look carefully at your coiling honey, Right, you will actually see, because when the honey's coiling to the left of the stream, the fluid actually has to connect over, and that is, yes, there is something, there's something propagating up. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So that part's not weird. The weird is the cracking spaghetti yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, but you're absolutely right. I have a question, yeah. too, but I'm sure that's, you're going to explain all that. I don't know if but, I will. <laughs> so, ask so, you know, so it, it, it kind of did a little jump <laughs> before the spaghetti breaking thing yeah. happened. And the pieces of the spaghetti look longer every time. Yeah, so there's a lot we don't understand in that video. Okay, that's it's very cool, that's <laughs> um, beautiful. But one thing that's true is that when the droplets lose contact with the main, with the mothership, right, they've lost their electrical contact, so they start dissolving oxide, and they ball back up, and then balling up can pop stuff up, right? So there's like, inside the pile, there's like a whole other set of drama going on. Yeah, so I think that's what's going on there, but we, there's a lot to look at. Okay, so for them, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so you mentioned about using a long neck fume. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering that uh, the velocity is continuously increasing, right, as you go down? Uh, um, that's a good question, how much it increases. We can test that because if it's increasing, it would need to get narrower at the bottom than it was at the top. Because uh -huh. you have you have some right you have some mass conservations you're supposed to obey, yes. <laughs> right? Um, and so it's not narrowing much. Uh, okay, it is narrowing a little bit, but it's not, and so we actually can estimate how much it's speeding yeah, up yeah. from that. No, because the viscosity being so low, uh, do you worry about like going to high Reynolds number? We're not in a high Reynolds number situation, and the viscosity is only twice that of water, water. and sodium hydroxide is essentially water, so there's not much viscosity contrast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think that's a major, that's not, we don't, we haven't thought that's a major issue. It may be a correction term. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. so coiling, yep, yeah, go ahead. So, so when the sur surface tension gets compromised and you get into these, um, these uh, yeah, the straight lines kind of thing, the, it's the shock propagation which is actually doing the breaking. I actually think it's buck. I think it's buckling, right? That you basically now have a rigid tube, but it's getting pushed from the top, right? And so eventually it buckles. So we think that's the instability, but these are actually pretty new results. 
Okay. These are actually pretty new results, and we ha there's, a, there's actually wonderful work on spaghetti breaking that we can compare to, and we, that's work that we need to do still. Okay. This, this one's easier to follow. The coiling is easier to follow. Uh, I had a question about Taylor's number because I was trying to work it out in my head, yeah. and I'm getting a rather large number. Okay, we, should sit, we can sit down and look at that afterwards. Okay, yeah. Is kind of low, right? yeah the, in the our calculations of it so far, it's been low, but if you think it's not, we can look at it in a little bit. Okay, so the coiling radius is something that's well predicted, <laughs> okay, for Newtonian fluids, okay, and it depends on the radius of the thread, the flux, the volumetric flux, the viscosity and the density, um, so we can calculate that. These are all known numbers for our, our liquid. The surface tension um, is supposed to not be an effect here, right, but obviously we think it's interesting, okay, and if we do that, the ratio of our radius to this predicted one, this should be one, right? This should be one, and it's not one, right? <laughs> okay, so it's roughly constant, and this is as we increase the current, and above 600 is when we start to get spaghetti, so we've left spaghetti off the plot, okay? Um, so this should be one, it's not, it's about three or four, okay? Which means there's an additional effect we're not accounting for here, and so the viscosity is the Newtonian viscosity, so a couple of things are going on. One, we probably shouldn't neglect surface tension here. So we have to redo the analysis where we include surface tension. And the second thing is there might be surface viscosity from those oxides. And so this, so a bunch of, so this mu for viscosity probably hides a bunch of sins. So the, the, the surface tension scaling and the viscosity scaling aren't so easy to disentangle. Okay, so that's probably what's causing this constant factor off. But also as you go at the, at the lower end where you just have a light oxide, in fact, we're seeing much larger we're seeing much larger um, radii than we'd expect. And so this is probably a surface tension effect that we haven't untangled yet. So this is, this is ongoing work. I don't have an answer to that question. But we are seeing radii that are much larger than what we'd expect from classical fluid dynamics. And this is one of the benefits of working, you know, so we have this, we have this material we don't understand. We have really well-known theoretical results from Newtonian fluids, and so we're hoping by comparing a material we don't understand to one we do understand, we can sort out what's weird about this oxide layer, which is so thin that we can't really measure it, okay? And so we're trying to use fluid dynamics as our tool to understand the mechanics of something we can't see, right? And so this is sort of, yeah. Having this, uh, this kind of piling up is usually a sign of a non-Newtonian liquid, right? It is, right? yeah, and this is non-Newtonian in the sense yeah, that it's yeah. covered in this scum, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot going on here, yep. Um, all right. So another geometry we've looked at um, is that initial one that caught my eye, which is that you have a droplet that's a fixed size droplet, you expose it to a voltage, and it starts to spread under gravity and make these wonderful flower shapes. Okay, and one of the tools that have been used in you know, pattern formation over the years is to try to make what's called a large aspect ratio system. So something that's thin and wide, right? So you have lots of room to make pattern, lots of nice radial symmetry to work with, okay? Um, and so this is about um, 30 centimeters wide, this dish. We now run the copper electrode all the way around the outside edge, so they have a completely uniform electric field. We put the droplet in the center, and it's, it's, it's sitting on the wire, so it's got a nice little electrical contact, and we watch it spread, okay? And now the voltage is, from here on, we're gonna be pretty consistent, okay? Um, every voltage you see is gonna be measured referenced to the reference electrode, which is actually at minus 1.5 volts, so when I say zero, I mean it matches the reference electrode, okay? So now the voltages are consistent from here on, okay? Um, all right, so when you only apply a little bit of voltage, okay, it doesn't really lower this, there's only a, you've, you've, add, you've lowered the surface tension, but you're still in the regime where you have a nice droplet. You can actually predict the radius by just balancing the gravitational force against the Laplace pressure, right? And as the surface tension lowers, the radius grows. So this is just a force balance type of thing, okay? However, at some point, if your surface tension, right, starts to drop, right, then this arrow, the green arrow starts to get shorter and gravity starts to win and it starts to spread. So you expect to see more spreading the lower the surface tension goes, okay? So this is where things start to get interesting. If you drop it even, so if you, if you apply more voltage, you start to see instabilities as the droplet spreads. It can no longer spread radially symmetrically. Okay, so I'll just let you guys enjoy this as it goes. Again, we're not injecting fluid. This is just the fluid rearranging. 
and we generate essentially cauliflower broccoli, right? <laughs> Classic fractally, you know, fingers upon fingers upon fingers, which is beautiful and pretty. And you can see when a piece breaks off, right? It loses electrical contact, right? Um, some interesting things will start happening as these threads break. This guy balls up. And actually, you'll now know where downhill is in just a minute. Downhill is to the right. It was not perfectly level. <laughs> okay. But what's remarkable to me, okay, so the fractals are lovely. And we'll talk about the fractals in a second. But if I look at this picture, I've got places where there's both positive curvature and negative curvature of the interface, which already suggests we've got a very low surface tension, right? Or you couldn't support both of these, okay? Um, so these are fractals, and we're gonna ask the question, how are they happening, okay? So we go through a bunch of these movies, right? Um, and each, and, and the different colors here are at different amounts of time. I measure, I use a Hausdorff box counting algorithm to measure the fractal dimension, okay? Um, these are roughly what they look like at these points where I did it. And you know, by about 30 seconds, it's at a really nicely developed uh, fractal, which over a number of orders of magnitude gives us a fractal dimension of like 1.3. Okay, so this is a nice fractal. And again, we can take advantage of the fact that there's a well, there's a lovely history of fractal dimensions being tabulated for various instabilities. And we can hope that this may help us classify what mechanism is causing these fractals. Okay. So here's a nice idea. Directional solidification makes beautiful fractals and solidifying alloys, right? Um, and so this one, uh, this one's actually a uh, polymer system. This is a metal system. These make these beautiful fern-like uh, fractals. Um, it's sometimes called dendritic growth. The metallurgists love this um, instability. And certainly, it captures the right range of the fractal dimension. Okay, but we're not segregating the material into a something rich and something poor domain, which is usually what happens here. Okay, and so this doesn't feel like the mechanism matches our system, right? We remain with the liquid metal being one place and the sodium hydroxide being someplace else. So this, the fractal dimension matches, but it's tough to get the mechanism. Um, another popular, nice, pretty fractal making system is viscous fingering. Um, actually, Ermgard was just here um, six weeks ago talking about making beautiful um, patterns as well. Um, and these also don't look so dissimilar from what we're seeing, um, but their fractal dimensions are almost always a lot higher than what we see, okay? 1.3 is sort of too low for these sorts of fractals. And worse, viscous fingering requires, on a big vis requires you have a nice viscosity contrast. And 2x viscosity contrast is not indicative of viscous fingering situation, okay? So we don't think it's viscous fingering either, okay? Um, Another common one is um, actually surfactants can cause fingering, right? Um, and so here's some examples from, these are all from you know, aqueous um, and alcohol-based systems uh, where they're basically a droplet is put down and it spreads, okay? And these are all caused by what are called Marangoni effects or gradients in surface tension, okay? And this starts to look more promising because we have this oxide on the surface that could be rearranging, okay? So we're gonna pursue this as a likely explanation for what's going on, okay? Um, and I will say, before we go on to that, I wanna fill you in on just the last two things that happen. If I keep making more oxide, if I keep cranking up the voltage, making more and more oxide, um, we can monitor um, the area of the droplet. Okay, so we did regime A, which is the droplet just made a nice steady droplet. We did regime B where we made this fractal and it grew and grew and grew and eventually actually uh, a color, um, event, actually the, the purple. It grew and grew and grew and grew in radius, in area. I realize saying area for fractal is slightly weird. This is just counting the dark pixels, okay? But if we continue to crank up the voltage, you get droplets that start to do what the fractal does and then collapse, okay? And that's C, I'm gonna play that again, okay? So C is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow, but you notice it doesn't finish making the fractal. Right, it gets arrested and eventually recontracts its area, okay? At the same point, that's as this star, where it starts to contract, this, it's terrible to measure resistance in electrochemical system. This is just the ratio of current and voltage. It's not an ohmic system. This is a very crude measure, okay? But the resistance starts to rise 
at this point where it contracts. And that suggests that that oxide layer is becoming thicker and the oxide is no longer a good electrical conductor. Okay, in fact, some of these oxides are semiconductors, some are insulators, right? Um, and so it stops conducting electricity, right, and forms a solid shell, and that solid shell seems to be able to contract it. If you apply an even larger voltage, right, that's this regime D, it never even manages to make fingers. It just grows oxide and then contracts, okay? So it looks like there's a reentrant surface tension right, that you, surface tension is coming in from some other effect. The surface tension acts to contract droplets, okay. So this oxide seems to be able to both destabilize the system, but then also to restabilize it if you have too much of it, okay. And so we actually mapped out a phase diagram for this, right, so depending on the size of, I've been showing you droplets that all have this volume, we did larger and smaller ones, okay. Um, but in fact, there's a regime where you see this fractal spreading and in general it's taken over and you lose, you eventually lose your fractal behavior if you push too hard. Okay, so we want to understand that. Okay. And so here's a, a very schematic picture of what we think is going on and we'll dive a little bit more into this depending on how far we get. Okay, so in regime A, which is just the shiny droplet, there's, only, there's barely any oxide, you just have this Laplace versus gravity balance and you get a nice droplet. Okay, if you have a thin oxide surfactant, so think dilute coverage, you know, think lipid monolayer, right? That's what's dropping the uh, surface tension effectively to zero, okay? But if you put on too much voltage, okay, there seems to be a re-entrant surface tension. It gets a surface tension back and now that Laplace pressure can win again um, over gravity and it, re it recollects itself. Okay. And one of the reasons that this could happen, and this is seen in other metal systems, is that you actually, it, it takes energy to drive an ion through an interface, right? That's an energetic cost per unit area to drive those ions through, and that shows up, like we said, energy per unit area, like a surface tension, okay? And so the reason this surface tension exists is because of the current. The reason this surface tension exists is because of the interatomic uh, bonds for the metal, okay? So it's for a different reason. So this is schematic. If we get all the way to the end, I'll do a little bit better job on this, on under, of being less hand wavy here. We're starting to get an idea of what, a, a more uh, electrochemically uh, accurate picture than this hand waving one. Okay, questions about this hand waving picture? If you could go over the second definition of surface tension, the I mean, the way it comes about in the electrical context. Okay, yeah. so if I have this oxide layer that's gotten thick and I'm still driving current through it, if, I'm an, if I need to drive an ion through that oxide layer, the oxide layer needs to like open up and let somebody through. Again, hand waving, right? I have to do work to get the current through this thick crust, okay? If the system, and then if I'm doing an energy calculation, that, so therefore that interface is now the cost, the original cost of the surface tension, which was now very low, right, because the oxide lowered it very far. So there was almost free interface. It was almost, it almost cost nothing to make that interface now from a bond standpoint. But now to drive the ions through costs energy, and it costs energy every place along the surface. And so it feels like an energetic cost per unit area. So it's effective surface tension, yeah. So it's, but it only makes sense if you think about it in an energy standpoint, from a spore standpoint, I don't understand it, right? Which is why I like the energy way of framing it. So Gibbs, <laughs> I like Gibbs. <laughs> yeah. So in the second scenario, why the rigidity of the film is not coming into it picture? It is actually. And so um, this is not a full picture. I'm only talking about the surface tension here and not about the rigidity. Um, in fact, I don't think I have a good movie here, um, but in fact, when you look at the surface of it, when it recontracts, you get ripples and you get like, it looks like folding of a crust, you know, um, like you'd see on milk scum, right? That you get wrinkling and so forth. So, that, so it's a very, so that in fact, the, that layer has buckled. Yeah, and so there's actually an energetic cost for that too during the crumpling and that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so are these fingers due to Marangoni fingering, right? So we have this framework where these surfactants are at the surface. So what is Marangoni fingering? Okay, so in general, lots and lots of systems 
where you can generate surface tension gradients will finger. This is a very generic phenomenon, okay? And you know, in this picture, uh, and you know, in various ones of various different of these pictures, um, we are you're seeing the fingers because a temperature gradient has caused differences in surface tension. In the top one, a concentration uh, gradient has caused like alcohol versus water concentration has varied. So wine tears, which are on the re uh, result, uh, arise because the the water content and the alcohol content of wine segregates somewhat, and that's what causes the fingers. Okay, so this is a, a very well-known and well-studied phenomenon. Okay, so we need to understand surface tension gradients. Okay, so quiz question for the audience. I'm going to put more surfactant on the left and less surfactant on the right, and I'm going to stick a little boat there. I'm going to really do this, by the way. Which direction? is the boat going to move? <laughs> so talk to your neighbor while I switch over to this camera. Talk to your neighbors and decide if you think the boat's going to move towards the higher concentration, lower surface tension, or towards the lower concentration, highest surface tension. Okay. And I'm going to use my zoom camera as a camera here. All right, so who votes it moves to the surfactant-y side? Who votes it moves to the non-surfactant-y side? Who doesn't vote? One of those three choices has to <laughs> cover you. Okay, move, so boat moves towards the low surfactant side. Who votes towards that? Okay, we got, we got a 10, 12 people. Who votes it moves towards the high surfactant side? All right, we don't have a very, yeah, we got a, it got a pretty even split. Okay, so let's do the experiment. This is clean water from the filter out there. You guys see this? All right, I need to put a little bit more in so I get a nice full. I'll clean up afterwards, I promise. All right. Um, I made some little boats. Here's our little sailboats. They're made of paper. They don't last that long. We'll have to work quickly. Okay, here's soap from the tea room on my finger, dish soap. Oh, come on, go back to the center, dude. All right, so I'm gonna put, so high surfactant side right here. <laughs> okay, it moves away from the surfactant side. Do we agree? Experimentally, <laughs> okay? You can do this yourself. Any, any bowl you have at home, dish soap, little piece of paper, okay? If you wanna repeat it and check that I didn't lie to you. Yeah. For those of us who grew up at a certain time, camphor boats, you remember those? Yeah, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we understand this? Okay, so remember, higher, sur higher concentration of molecules, surface molecule means lower surface tension, okay? Um, lower concentration means higher surface tension. So which direction did this guy move? It moved, it moved towards the low concentration area. I put a bunch of soap over here. Okay, so it moved that way. I think at this point it is actually easier to think about tension as force because this guy has higher force than this guy and who wins the tug of war? The higher force side. So this is a place where it's actually easier to think about surface tension as a force and not as an, an energy per unit area. Okay? So this is quite general. Okay? This also, so basically, so there's also, let's take the boat out of the picture for a second. <laughs> okay. So now the boat's not in the picture. There are no boats in our problem. Okay, there's just oxide molecules. Okay, so yes, diffusion will start to equalize this, but diffusion's too slow. Diffusion's not a major effect here. The major effect is that there is going to be a pulling of those molecules into that side of the thing. Okay. So we can generate surface tension gradients if we have concentration gradients in the oxide. Okay. Um, so, how do interfaces go unstable? This is a really general argument if you haven't seen instabilities, okay? So usually you take some smooth interface and it probably is not as smooth as you think it is. So you imagine it having a set of Fourier modes, right, of different fluctuations. And you ask, does this wavelength that I, let, let, I'm gonna say on a wavelength of one millimeter, right, does that mode grow or decay? Right, now try the wavelength of two millimeters. Does that mode grow or decay? 
Okay? And a common technique for doing this is a linear stability analysis. You put in a, a guess of a plane wave and you see, do you think is it going to grow or decay based on doing a calculation? Okay? You can also do this experimentally. You can impose a wavelength and see if that wavelength grows or shrinks. Right? It's not so, asking how linear, in, how instabilities happen, you can do it in math, but you can also just do it in the lab. Right? We can impose a wavelength. Okay? So Keith Hilaire was a grad student in my lab, and he did exactly this. He built a little line of e-gain, okay? and he imposed a certain periodicity on it, and then said, go forth and make and spread. And lo and behold, can you guys see what happened to the, these fingers? He tried to pick fingers of one wavelength. What did the e-gain decide? It's like, I like a shorter wavelength. Thank you very much. Okay, this is called tip splitting. Okay, so the e-gain knows it prefers a shorter wavelength over a longer wavelength. Okay, so this is a system that's unstable to shorter wavelength instabilities. The shorter wavelength should have a faster growing um, behavior. Okay, so let's just zoom in on this. Okay, so here's a movie of it. And so this thing just tip splits and tip splits and tip splits. This is the beginnings of those fractals we were talking about, right? So this guy just doesn't like fat fingers, <laughs> right? It wants to go, okay, and then some of them lose contact and they roll off again. And now you will know which direction downhill is. There's always a downhill direction. We cannot get this level enough, okay? All right, so we can do a bunch of experiments at different wavelengths. So this W0 at the, broad, at the bottom is the wavelength we impose. Okay, the width of the finger we impose, actually, we impose finger widths to have. And then we look under, as a function of how much applied current, uh, what shape we get. Okay? And we all start them on copper, because actually the metal wets copper, and so we can give them a home base, and then they spread off the home base. Okay? If it's, you have just a little bit of oxide, you get this you know, little finger sticking out. Eventually they tip split, and eventually they go fractal. So this is just a, you know, a phase diagram of what states we see. But we can also follow the dynamics and see how fast they grow. Okay? So we can um, look for um, experiments that have a different amount of current, so from 80 milliamps per finger up to 160 milliamps per finger. We're normalizing by per finger here to sort of help uh, compare across things. Okay? We can, and so the length is just how far the image has grown out. And you can see here that the yellow ones, the higher finger, the higher current ones have a faster growth rate than the lower current ones, right? So this is the growth rate, this is the linearized growth rate of each of these fingers, okay? Um, and this just got cut off. Uh, let me get the, that's weird. What happened there? I, I trimmed a little too much. Let's untrim that. There we go. All right, so this is the velocity of the finger as a function of how much current we apply for different initial finger widths. Okay, so who is growing the fastest? Short, um, skinny fingers or fat fingers? The skinny fingers are growing faster, which means if you have a skinny finger, it's gonna outpace a fast finger. That's what causes tip splitting. The, any perturbation on the surface of the fat finger, the skinny finger is gonna take over and win. Okay, that's a really generic pattern formation mechanism. Okay, and so it looks like this is following things we think of as being Marangoni tip splitting, but we can't see where the oxide is, so we can't tell if there's a surface tension gradient. So Keith very cleverly came up a way to do the best he could. Okay, so he took um, some copper filings and sprinkled them on the surface of a, of a system that's undergoing tip splitting, okay, in post-processing, he colored each of those copper filings so that you could see them, okay? So the, the red, green, and blue little colored dots here, that's not real. That's him painting the picture afterwards, okay? So as this is growing out, as this finger is growing out, which direction are the copper filings? They're being driven back the other direction. So the finger is growing out, but the surface is moving back. In other words, it's being driven by a Marangoni right, gradient in oxide, almost certainly. Okay. Without seeing the oxide, we cannot get the smoking gun for this. We have tried. I would, if people have clever ideas about how to see oxide on the surface of this, I am all ears. Right? This is something that's been a continual struggle for us. 
The oxide is so dilute here that it's still shiny, right? Once it gets matte, when it's, when it's the thick crust, we can see it. But in this stage, we have, we've tried, and it's very, very difficult to see. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. One more, uh, one more quick geometry, um, which is that I want to look at droplets which we're letting slide down a plane, okay? Why are we doing this experiment? Um, we want things to go slowly. So yeah. Yes. Also do modeling of all this? Yes. Like chemical I, I, modeling of? Hold two slides. Hold two slides. Okay. So this is a system that we developed because we would be able to do modeling on it. So we, all these other ones have multi, like things are happening in lots of different directions, right? The flow is this way, the fractal's that way. So we, we decided to drop down to just one droplet sliding down an incline so that we could do one dimensional models, the easiest possible model that we could imagine doing. So we will get to the model in a second. So this is a droplet that's allowed to slide down an incline. Okay, and this is what it looks like. And that's a little weird. Like, so it's a lot like droplet pinch off, right? But do you guys notice that the droplet is shaped like an ice cream cone and has like a fish tail? That's the, the oxide's doing that. <laughs> okay? So there's some things here that I don't know how to model. But a droplet going down an incline is something I can model. Okay, so if you look at the, see the yellow stuff at the top? That's a mirror on the side. That's a lot easier to model. That's the side profile of the droplet, right? And that's something we think we can model. So that's our first model, is can we capture this droplet sliding down, developing a shape, and pinching off? Okay, and we can do that as a 1D model. And um, so we're gonna stick to this regime here where you have a drop, this is like for lots of different voltages, these are movies, right? This is a very general property that you get these droplets, you know, sliding off and pinching off. And at higher voltages, you get crazy extra morphologies, right? You go from having nice teardrops to these rippled ice cream cone chill drops. So we're going to stay in this area here, okay? This intermediate regime where we get droplet pinch off, but we don't get as much drama as that, okay? Um, and so this is the beginnings. Um, of that model. So Hangji Amji is my colleague in applied math and her um, postdoc Sordeep and grad student Jesse Chen have been working on this for the last year. I think this, this is the first time I've talked about this in public. Um, so they are taking classic thin films equations. So H is the height of the droplet, okay, and modeling what the oxide concentration is along the surface and that's allowed to be spatially heterogeneous now, okay. And so the typical terms that you put into a thin film uh, equation are that there's um, pressure, like you know, fluid pressure, there's gravity, and this includes surface tension effects, um, and there's Marangoni forces. And the Marangoni forces, um, so gamma is the, is the concentration of the surface oxide, and X um, is one derivative, there's another derivative out here, so these are gradient-like, okay. We are including both the intermolecular forces and also the interfacial forces in doing this. Okay, um, for the oxide, we have similar equation, similar terms on the left, but, and, um, but on the right, we actually have to have flux terms, right? So you actually are generating oxide through the current, okay? Um, and you can have some diffusion from the Peclet number, and you actually potentially have some electrophoresis, okay? So these are, this is like the simplest model that they could imagine writing down. Okay, the simplest, like the minimum number of terms that like these, ha these probably have to be there. Other things might be present, but this is a minimum model. It the current enters through oxidation Yeah, the current is coming in through there. Yeah, okay. And we know some of these numbers better than others. Okay, so just to give a sense of our work to try to understand these, um, I should wrap up now. Okay, we are measuring things like the coverage density, right, and the thickness and the dissolution rate. So we're starting to get a handle on some of what those parameters are. We know them to the right order of magnitude. We don't know them in detail, okay? But here's a sample uh, of a solution to the model. And so the top one is the droplet shape, okay? And the bottom one is the concentration, okay? And it turns out there actually is more concentration, um, higher concentration at the back of the droplet, okay? Uh, according to this prediction. We can't measure that again in the real system, okay? But we're capturing some basic things that seem to match what we're seeing in the experiments, and now we, it's a matter of fine-tuning parameters and trying to actually get quantitative agreement. But qualitatively, the model now captures the behaviors we see. So we're really excited to see this. 
the, we have not, this is a 1D model, so we can't finger yet. So the idea is we'll get the 1D model working, then we let it be a 2D model, and then we can look for fingering. So we're not at fingering yet. We're, we're at the simpler geometry. Yeah, we're not ready to finger. Yeah, in the, in the model, that's coming. Yeah, but that, that, is, that is in fact very much what we're after, because to demonstrate that it actually is Marangoni fingering, we need to get the model showing that it is. Okay, we are, um, we are just in the time. I was gonna say briefly, with our wonderful electrochemist friends, um, who are these folks right here, we have actually done a whole bunch of electrochemical measurements, um, and I am going to skip those entirely because we're at the end, <laughs> okay? Um, we actually now have some sense of how the electrochemistry works out. Um, so just to go to the conclusions, all right, liquid metals can produce these surface oxides through electrochemical reactions, the same ones you learned about in high school chemistry, very generic. What's amazing is that those oxides can be such a powerful surfactant, right, and that they can do so many things like suppressing instabilities, creating instabilities, their rearrangements seem to control a whole host of behaviors, right, um, and the cool thing is, is that when you turn off the voltage, they redissolve. That would be like me taking the soap out of this water. Like, so unlike most surfactant experiments where once you've contaminated it, you're done, I can't do this experiment again. I'd have to wash this whole thing out and start over. This I can do and redo experiments, right? So it's a really nice place to look at how interfacial effects can control stability and instability in fluids. It's a really nice model system for that. Um, and it's a completely safe, a few volts, sodium hydroxide, non-toxic metal, right? It can be used as a model for things like people who are doing um, batteries, like, you know, so lithium ion batteries and metal batteries often have fluids inside that are turning over, right? People doing instabilities in casting of aluminum where there's oxidation. There's a lot of systems that are metals that are very difficult to study because they're opaque at really high temperatures, right? And this is one where it's not. You can just do it on the tabletop, right? Um, and so I think it's a really, really fun system. And, you know, part of me talking about it is because we're still learning to understand it. And part of it is, is that I think it's a really good place for more people who have physics and fluids training to be doing experiments and not to just say this is something that's for engineering purposes. I think it's a really cool physics system. All right, thank you. Thanks, Karen. That was fascinating. Uh, questions? Students first. Yes. The props have talked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering about the, you, to, you told about the, what is the uh, effect of the potential earth current, mm -hmm. uh, how it uh, oxidizes the things, but what about the flow rate? Yeah, so that actually matters. Um, uh, do I have that on here? Yes, so this is the liquid. So I was showing you pictures from this, this stream right here. So this is being pumped at constant rate. That's this green regime. So some of the transitions from like a, dro a, you know, a dripping faucet to that do not depend on the flow rate. So these um, boundaries are vertical. And the ones that involve crust do depend on the flow rate. Because if you're making interface too fast, then you don't have time to put oxide on it before it's gone. And so anything that involves the crust ha has flow rate dependence, we think, and things that don't involve crust seem to have a lot less flow rate dependence. In case of uh, the pattern formation when the fractal things develops, there you maintain a constant flow rate, and that should be of yeah. a very definite. So, uh, yeah, so some of the, so the, the liquid stream experiments are all constant flow rate. Everything else is a, const is, a, is a fixed droplet that we deposit and then it flows. So we have two different, we've used two different conditions depending on, but the, anything that involves a vertical stream that's coming as a constant flow rate from a syringe pump. Yeah. Okay, another point, uh, do you have any means to uh, quantify the oxidation layer? Because uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that seems to be because as the yeah. fractal yeah. develops. Yeah. So, that so we cannot monitor it in real time. So in real time, it's basically shiny, and it's constantly moving. And if you try to take it out of the, the system it's in, you actually change what's oxidized. So we have done experiments where we let the crust form, and then we tip the liquid out, and we take the crust, and we go and try to do XPS on it, right, and try to figure out what the oxide is. That has not yielded things that make us confident. Um, we are, with our electrochemist colleagues, we're starting to, to sort of 
um, do measurements on the stuff that's left in the fluid. And we've been trying lots of things to identify which the oxides are. Are they gallates? Are they this oxide? This is, so identifying which chemical species they are is in progress. And we have some we think and some we, we, we are less certain of. Um, but in real time, we can't monitor it. Yeah, there's no way, there's no way, either it's thickness or it, what it is. Yeah, we don't have a way to do that yet. Someone clever can figure this out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in, in your tip splitting and fractal pattern formation experiments, so, uh, so why, when the pattern is evolving, why from the behind it splits from the uh, base? Oh, it slips, okay. So there's not a, there's an asymmetry, right? Mm -hmm. So if I look at, let me go back to that. Um, so there's an asymmetry. So I want this one. Okay, so, the, so there's a electrode hooked up. So th this is sitting on a copper plate, and the electrode is hooked up to that copper plate, and to someplace out in the bath is the other electrode, okay? So there's a, there's a gradient in that direction, okay? The oxide is forming where there's good access to an electrical current coming in, and that's not true here, okay? So the oxide is almost certainly forming more in the front than in the back, okay? Also, the droplet can't flow backwards because we've built a little wall. It can only flow forwards. So we gave it, a, so this is strongly directional, okay? So we told it it has to go in that direction, and it can only grow in that direction, and so that's the direction it's fingering in. And this is an experimental design choice okay. because with the radially, the one that was making the beautiful fractals, it could go in all directions, yes. right? Everything's interacting with everything else, and so this was designed to be simpler and to have there be a, a definite axis we, where we knew the asymmetry was. Yeah, so that, that was a conscious choice on our part. This is meant to be the dumb version of the fancy version. Got <laughs> dumb for good reason. <laughs> and one more uh, point uh, is that, uh, so when these oxide layers form, so in your regime uh, C and D, mm -hmm. so the oxide layer is thicker, so wouldn't the elasticity of that oxide yes. layer would play a role? It, it does play a role, and you can actually tap on it like it's got, it's got an elasticity, you can poke it, it then jiggles, right? So it really does have an elasticity. We have never done careful measurements of that elasticity. It's on the list of things to do, right? Um, but yeah, it, it has an actual rigidity to it and it buckles when it contracts. Yeah, yeah, because elasticity is known to reduce the pattern formation. Yes, exactly, and it absolutely does, yeah. Okay. But we have not done careful measurements in that regime yet. Yeah. Thank you. This is why I want to recruit more people to work on this fascinating system, because there's a ton of stuff to be done. There's a ton of stuff to be done. Yeah. I mean, elasticity makes smaller fingers, but it can also make more fingers. Yeah, so, and, and I, you know, I don't think and, you can say that elasticity really suppresses instability. It doesn't always. Okay. There it you changes go. the nature of the instability, okay. yeah. Yeah. But certainly, it's, it's an important component of understanding it. And also from that side. Huh? No? Okay. So why do you think, I think, uh, Sanjan had a question. Now he's allowed to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, is uh, the droplet uh, falling uh, down the incline, do you say that uh, it is not clear where the oxide layer is going? Yeah. This, it's, moving, it's moving backwards in the center. Yeah, but then that seems like such a tension is lowered there and an oxide. Yeah, it, it does suggest that. But certainly there's a gradient, right, where it has more. Um, so this case, because we did the experiment, right, we know that that means that if it's being pulled in this direction, this is the direction with less um, oxide. But that makes sense because the oxide is being made at the surface, on the front surface, probably. Uh, I think that's the direction. No, I, Okay, so the, so the oxide, so the, the, the current, the current, the, the current, most of the, most of the current, if you think of this as current lines, current lines are going this way, right? And so the oxide, this is the interface where we're making oxide, right? And so there's more oxide being made here at this interface. There's not oxide, much oxide being made back here. There's not much interface. And so this is the direction it's getting pulled, is towards the back. Oh, okay. 
So I think this makes, I think it's consistent with the argument. What we can't say is that we see where the oxide is. That, yeah, so, so, so I think that's, so I think it's, it's being circulated like that. Yeah, we remember the demo the boat. This is why there was the boat demo. This is why the boat demo exists. <laughs> it moves away from where you put the, the, the soap. It's not intuitive. Yeah, it's not intuitive. And it would be lovely if we could see better where things were. It really would. I mean, not being able to see is, is a hard part of this project. So this is probably a trivial question. So I wanted to ask. Probably uh, not. <laughs> Uh, what is the relationship between uh, the regions of negative curvature and positive curvature with the surface tension? In oh, okay. So if you have, okay, so think about the, a liquid metal drop just sitting in liquid, right? The, the, it, it is a droplet of metal that's positively curved within the, the liquid. It's a droplet of metal that's round within a background, right? So the direction of the curvature, right, is from Laplace pressure. Right? And that sign is going to tell you something right, about higher and lower surface tension. If you're seeing both positive and negative curvature, that suggests that both are present and it must be zero. Right? It's like when you shake, when you sh when you do, when you shake up salad dressing, oil and you know, vinegar, right? you, know, you have droplets of oil within the vinegar. Mm -hmm. right? So this is, so, I mean, it's not a, it's not, that's not meant to be a quantitative argument. It's just that it's weird when you see both positive and negative curvature for the same interface. Like that's a, it's not a definitive proof that it's zero surface tension. It's that this must be really low or this wouldn't be stable. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. There can be other forces involved. Yeah. Other questions? I have one. So, you know, in the fractal fingering regime that you had, what sets the number of, you know, primary fingers that you started we've off never, with? We've never been able to see something specific there. Okay. Yeah. I saw five and six mostly, Yeah, the, most of them are sort of around that number, and that must be because there's some wavelength that seems to be, but I don't know what that is. Maybe yeah. one can also change that by changing the, you know, the, the symmetry of the it substrate. Might be. So, so like Ermgard does. Um, yeah, exactly, that, yes. Yeah. So we have yeah. never done, but most of them right. are pretty similar. They're sort of five, six-ish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's one more. I don't need the microphone. You do, because it could. Uh, people on Zoom will need Okay, it, so yeah. my question is, since we are providing that electricity and it's after some point of time, it's more like the voltage is more. Does mm -hmm. the thing heat up? Like does it heat yeah. up? It doesn't heat up much. No, these are pretty low. These are it's these are not. Small, right? these are, yeah, they're pretty so small. So since you said that, it and also metal is a really good conductor. Huh. <laughs> it is a good yeah. conductor, right? So when we say that it moves forward, mm -hmm. and there is a slight increase in temperature, and you said that it doesn't melt at room temperature, but it does melt at the palm of your hand. This this. This is, this is we're not changing the temperature much here. Huh, but yeah. Now, my question is, the, is the heat, the change in temperature, significant enough to increase its mobility no. by any chance? No. It's, it's, not, it's not heating up. It's very close it's, to it's, insignificant. Yeah, it's, 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 there's, not a, there's not a major heating effect. Okay, that, yeah. that, Everything, everything's a really good conductor, and so there's not a lot of joule heating going on. Yeah. That, that's yeah. That, that's the yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And also, like, the, the, the upper surface of the fluid can easily dissipate heat. As well, right? There's not. Yeah, we we have not seen. I haven't even looked for temperature changes because it's not been something that we've that has been shown up. Yeah. So in most of these cases, what happens is there is some branch which is, which just gets removed and it becomes a so it goes away from the main metal. So when it's fingering? Yeah, after so it's here, fingering. So here, so what do you mean by goes away? Like this guy wins, or you mean it pinches off? Yeah, it pinches off. Pinches off, yeah. So they get pinched off because they're spreading and spreading and spreading, and at some point the thread isn't strong Breaking. enough, and it breaks. So is there a way to not make it go away? I mean, so as long as there's a driving force there, I mean, gra I, turning off gravity right, would stop it from spreading. I don't think that's a viable option, but it, but it would work, <laughs> right? And so as long as there's, I mean, the metal is heavy, right? And it wants to spread downhill, right? And the surface tension's not holding it back. So these things are spreading out, right, under gravity. And at some point, the last piece that's holding them falls apart. Yeah. So this, this, hap this is the death of all of, in the fractal case, this seems to be the death 
a universal end, end state. Yeah, it's also with the single droplet going downhill what happens too. Eventually, it makes a very thin thread and eventually that thread snaps. And this is true even for ordinary droplets. Right? You do get pinch off of droplets just from a stream. Right? This, is, this is not something weird. This is, th that part is, I think, not, not unusual to this. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. <laughs> <laughs> This is amazing. I looked at this book when we were here the other week, and this is, yeah. yeah we also have a museum. Like, the museum, in the museum, yeah, yeah, it was in the museum, and so we saw, so, this is a real treasure. Thank you so much. Because I mean, so actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this to, my, one of my colleagues two doors down from me is a Raman spectroscopist. When I show him this, he's gonna be so jealous. <laughs> he's gonna be so jealous. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your wonderful questions. That makes a great audience. It doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now we have uh, coffee outside. Yeah. And, and, if you, and those of you who didn't want to ask me questions in public, ask me questions you when it's quiet. You still have half an hour. Yeah. yeah.